Before we begin, we publish new content every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You'll hear a man giving information to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Good morning, University of Radstock students, and thank you for coming out today. As some of you may already know, my name is Scott Barnes, and I am the director of the Student Services Office here at the university. I'm here today to give you some information about what Student Services has to offer you. To begin with, let me just say that I feel that our office will play an important role in the way that all of you will experience your time here at Radstock as students. Primarily, our center is geared towards providing answers to any questions you may have. Because all of our reception staff are currently enrolled as students at Radstock, we feel that we're in an excellent position to deal with any issues you may face during your time here at the university. As I said earlier, the Student Services Office is mainly a place where you can have your queries answered. However, the office is more than that. For example, if you come and visit us, you can pick up your student discount cards. Now, with these cards, which come at no additional cost to you, you can take advantage of reductions of up to 40% on all forms of public transport in the city. In addition, the cards are honored at many shops and restaurants in the area, giving you the chance to save up to 35% off food, beverages, and other purchases. Our office is also the place you should visit if you would like to get involved in any of the 30 different clubs and societies available at Radstock. Come in any time between 10 and 3 on weekdays and sign up to become a member of the university choir or orchestra, the drama or debating club, the university trivia team, the list goes on and on. For new students, I cannot stress enough how vital it is to participate in the non-academic side of university life. Yes, we are here to work hard and do our best at our studies, but student life is also about having fun and meeting like-minded people. So, bearing that in mind, make sure that you get involved and enjoy yourselves. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Moving along, I'd now like to talk to you about another very important service that our office provides, and that is counseling. I'm sure that you are all well aware that there are times in life when things can go wrong and times can get tough. We all have to endure difficult experiences and these difficulties can be emotional or physical. Whatever the case may be, talking with an experienced counselor can help you through the trying times. 
The counseling service here at Radstock is staffed by counselors who are qualified to help you deal with problems ranging from homesickness and loneliness to eating difficulties and life changes. To see a counselor, we recommend that you first visit our drop-in center. We run drop-in sessions on a daily basis from 9.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. And to reserve one of these sessions, you can telephone the counseling service on 121-5648-3907 on the day you wish to visit. Or, if you prefer, you can come into the student services office anytime after 8.30 a.m. and complete a booking form. If it should happen that you need to cancel your appointment for the drop-in session, we would request that you contact the counseling service as soon as possible to let them know. Drop-in sessions can be as short as 20 minutes, but it's more usual for them to take about 45 minutes. During that time, you will be asked some questions to clarify your situation, and a decision will be made as to what further action, if any, should be taken. After your session, several things may happen. Firstly, you may be referred to one of the university's counselors for further counseling, which normally consists of another eight sessions. Secondly, you may be asked to visit another source of help within the university, or finally, you may be referred to an external organization. Whatever course of action might be taken, you may rest assured that what goes on in these sessions is treated in strict confidence. I'd also like to mention that the counseling service runs numerous workshops on the campus every year. The focus of these workshops tends to be on personal development, and past topics have included motivation, self-identity, and impression management. There is no fee charged for these workshops, and if you require more information, feel free to contact us at stuser at acadia.co.uk. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. OK, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers, as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is, traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins when people get in from work are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news. Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, 
when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now, technological changes, which have fueled the rise of online news, have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television, in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full-page ads. So, what I would like to move on to... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. 
you will hear a recorded message about buying tickets from a booking agency. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Thank you for calling ATS Advanced Ticketing System, the call system for all your entertainment needs. Our automated telephone service is designed to answer your questions quickly and easily. The ATS office in the Regency Theatre is open Monday to Thursdays from 10am to 5pm and on Friday and Saturday till 8pm. For online bookings and detailed program listings check our website at www.atsticks.com That's spelled A-T-S-T-I-X Please listen to the choices available. You may press your choice as soon as you hear it to get more information. For sporting events, including the Western International Tennis Classic, press 1. For the Formula One Grand Prix, press 2. For classical music, including the upcoming Philharmonic Orchestra series, press 3. For theatre and dance, press 4. For other inquiries, please hold the line. Before the recorded message continues... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Ticket prices for the Formula One Grand Prix on the 10th until the 14th of March are as follows. General admission, Thursday, $27. Concession, $10. Friday, $37. Concession, $15. Saturday, $55. Concession, $35. Sunday, $70. Concession, $65. Concession rates apply to children under 14 and to students, seniors and pensioners on presentation of a valid card. Grandstand seating. Four-day tickets covering the six main grandstands cost $299. However, pit straight tickets are $350 and seats at the chicane cost $450 each. Children under three are admitted free to the general admissions area and children under 14 are eligible for concession prices. Gates open at 8am Thursday and Friday and 7.30 Saturday and Sunday. Events begin at 9 o'clock. Alcohol, ice boxes, cans, bottles and animals are not allowed on site. There are no refunds or exchanges. On each ticket, a $2.50 booking fee applies. To make a booking, you must have a valid credit card. To listen again, press 1. To make a booking 
or to talk to a ticket agent, press 2. Your call is in our queue. You can expect to wait about three minutes. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to introduce Rebecca Bramwell, an artist and illustrator who has come along today to talk to you all about getting your first job or commission as an artist. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you for inviting me. I remember when I graduated back in 1983, I was very excited about getting my first commission. My degree was in fine art, and I'd worked long and hard to get it. I was an enthusiastic student and I never found it difficult to find the incentive to paint. I think as a student you're pushed along by fellow students and tutors and the driving force is there. However, when you leave college you find yourself saying things like I'll have one more cup of coffee and then I'll sit down to work. I hate to admit it, but I say it myself. Suddenly, it isn't finding the inspiration or getting the right paper that's a problem. It's you. In my view, there are a number of reasons why this happens. It's a real challenge making a decent living as a new artist. You have to find a market for your work. Often you work freelance and need to take samples or portfolios of your work from place to place. These experiences are common to a lot of professional people. But artists also have to bear their souls to the world in a way. More than anything, they want praise. If people don't like what they create, then it can be a very emotional and upsetting experience hearing them say this. I began to realise that these problems were preventing me from having a career in art, and so I decided to experiment. I was a painter, but I started to dabble in illustration, drawing pictures for books, cards and this offered me the opportunity to become more emotionally detached from my work. I was no longer producing images from the heart, but developing images for a specified subject, taking a more practical approach. I began to develop a collection of my illustrations which I put into a portfolio and started to carry around with me to show prospective clients and employers. But it was still tricky because publishers, for example, want to know that your drawings will reproduce well in a book. But without having had any work published, it's hard to prove this. Having a wonderful portfolio or collection of original artwork is, of course, a first step. But what most potential clients would like to see is printed artwork. And without this evidence, they tend to hold back still when it comes to offering a contract. Well, I overcame this problem in two ways. And I suppose this is my advice to you on preparing your portfolio of your best work. The first way was by submitting my work for a competition. The one I chose was for a horoscope design and was sponsored by a top women's magazine. There are a few of these competitions each year and they offer new illustrators an opportunity to showcase their work. The other approach I took was to design and print some mock-up pages of a book. In other words, I placed some of my illustrations next to some text in order to demonstrate how my work would look when it was printed. Perhaps I was lucky in that I had taken a degree 
that provided me with all-round creative skills so that I could vary my style and wasn't limited to a certain technique. I think that is important. The art world and many other creative fields do try to pigeonhole people into snug boxes with an accompanying label. I think you should try to resist this if you feel it happening to you. If you don't, you'll find it difficult to have new work accepted if you try to develop your style at a later stage in your career. Nevertheless, when you start out, and particularly when you're going for an interview, it's important not to confuse people by having a lot of different examples in your portfolio. One remedy for this is to separate your work into distinct categories. In my case, I did this by dividing my design-inspired illustrations from my paintings. It is then easier to analyse the market suited to each portfolio, such as magazines, book jackets, CD covers, etc. Working under two names is also useful, as it clarifies the different approaches and offers a distinction between them. I think it's been hard for artists to be recognised in anything other than the pigeonholes that they have been placed in. Luckily, these barriers are slowly being demolished. This is the end of Section 4. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers.